I just hope I live to the expectation that I will probably upset most people in the room. Um, <laughs> that's what I tend to do. And had I known that uh, Caitlin would be speaking together, this would be about excessive transparency in procurement, which is one of my pet <laughs> topics. But uh, let's save it for another time. Um, the topic today is about new ideas that um, either the new directives are bringing forward or the new practice is consolidating and try and see whether they are such good ideas in the end, whether they are really conducive to innovation, or whether, because of wanting to do too much of a good thing, we're going to end up entrenching the current competitive situation. Um, my worry at the minute is a bit sector specific, and we're going to be talking mainly about social services. Hot topic. <laughs> Reform of the public administration, reform of public provision, reduction of budget. And I know I'm talking in Wales, and unfortunately, the only very bits I know about the UK are England related. So apologies from the beginning if anything I say is not applicable. But the idea in the last 10 minutes is to just look at provisions in Article 74 to 77 in the new general directive, which basically create a special regime that substitutes the old Part B services for most of the social services. Try to see what I think is a risk for the creation of local monopolies, not only now, but for the next 10, 20, 30 years, and to try and see which are the negative potential implications that I identify in these provisions based on innovation. So after a very lengthy discussion, and after the European Commission proposed new directives in basically November, December 2011, we come up with a new rebranded philosophy for this type of services. Basically, any contracts below what should be the equivalent of 630,000 pounds are in theory unregulated, but we'll see what the Court of Justice has to say about that. Uh, I'm sure they will keep pushing for transparency and non-discrimination. We can bet on that. But if you are above that threshold, then you have a sort of so soft touch regime that basically forces you as a contracting authority to disclose the intention to procure either by a contract notice or a prior information notice, and then to give some transparency, hopefully open data about the award. So what the main conditions of the contract, who has been the awardee, things I have issues with, but we can talk about that later. Um, but it, that's not very problematic. What I think is very problematic is that the directives consolidate member states' claims that these services are so different that they need different principles on which they are awarded, that they need different criteria in the award of the offers, and that they basically are different animal, needs a different treatment. And if we look at Article 76 in the new directive, it creates principles for the award of these contracts. The first problem I have is that we have a new Article 18 that consolidates the general principles on procurement, and basically the principles that I see there, but again, I might be a bit taking a different view, are transparency, non-discrimination, competition, and prevention of corruption, and then compliance with environmental and social requirements. But that's not what Article 76 says. Article 76 basically creates a different set of principles. It says social services should be basically awarded on soft criteria <coughs> based on the quality, continuity, accessibility, affordability, availability, and comprehensiveness of these services. Uh, lots of toys for the Court of Justice to play with, lots of new concepts, dangers in itself. Then it says it's also very important to take into account the special needs of the users of the services or the disadvantaged and vulnerable groups or the involvement and empowerment of users. And here I just think this is plainly technically incorrect. This is not something you should be taking into account when you are awarding the contract. You need to take this into account when you are designing the contract. This needs to be in the technical specs this needs to be in the conditions for participation. This is not something you take into account subjectively when you're awarding the contract. This is probably the most open to litigation clause I have seen in a very long time in the directives. And I don't make any money in litigation, so I can openly say, that's bad. I'm not a barrister. <laughs> I'm not triggering any business from this. And the last one, maybe very well intendedly, is that this should be awarded on innovation. OK, so we know the way services are being provided is maybe too much of the same thing. We want innovation, and we want to promote possibly SMEs to come and challenge status quo and bid for the contracts. So far, so good. So in theory, under Article 76, you could put out a call for tenders where 90% of the award is going to depend on innovation. Quite a lot of fun, quite a lot of litigation, too. But that's not true. 
And that's not true mainly because the UK has been very successful in the negotiations for the new directive, and they have created a carve-out that completely deactivates all the system. They have managed, and I still don't know how, to create a set-aside for these contracts that allow them to ring fence or reserve contracts for social services of any value. So this could go up to the hundreds of millions of pounds to certain types of companies. And this is seen as a set aside that probably indirectly goes to the issue of the spin-off and mutualization of public services. So what the UK government is trying to do, particularly in England, is to change the structure of the system, and they don't want to do it with any competition. And in itself, it's very, very problematic. Why I think it's problematic? Because they will tender these contracts, unlimited in value, up to three years, to companies that in theory comply some requirements that should maybe indicate they are third sector companies or mutuals. So the only companies that can be the beneficiaries of this reserve of contracts are companies that basically have a public service mission in their charters, that reinvest their profits in their activities, so either are non-for-profit or have collective distribution profits, we can think about cooperatives, for instance, that they have structure of management basically led by the workers and that the theory is they can only get one of these contracts every three years. If we think about what this implies, basically it means that if you have now, let's say, a hospital, it's part of the public sector, you want to privatize it, now you have the perfect formula. You get the workers to create a mutual, you transfer for one pound all the assets and liabilities of the hospital to the workers, you create a call for tenders and the provision of health services in the region for the next three years for 100 million pounds, and you say only hospitals already present in the region that comply with this can participate, legal. You give the contract to a hospital for three years, who's gonna be challenging this in three years? You have just committed the perfect crime. You have created a local private monopoly in what used to be the public sector. If you do this across the public sector, this completely destroys any potential cross-border competition for any social service, even inter-regional competition for social services. It's gonna be very easy to split the market on the basis of I don't enter your region, you don't enter my region. And I think it's very, very problematic. I think, obviously, this is not conducive to innovation. This is just entrenching the guys that are already there. I think privatization would make sense if some outsider can come and challenge the insider. This is just preventing that. And the only guys that have indicated they have some issues with this are the people at state aid control in the European Commission, which in 2012, when they approved the new package for the financing of social services of general economic interest, indicated that should these changes be in the final wording of the directives, they might want to revise their guidelines. And they're thinking about it. However, being such a hot, topic with such high stakes and being stated in such a bad position itself, I'm not so sure of how far they will go. So preliminary conclusions, and I hope I will be proven wrong because otherwise this is quite worrying. Um, we will have massive litigation based on the reserve of these contracts, particularly because the criteria for the award are just too soft, too undefined. I fear that the net long-term effect is going to be not innovation prone and not competitive prone, but the contrary. And so I think that in the two years that we have to implement the rules, we need to give very careful thought to these rules. My suggestion is just don't implement Article 77. Just don't allow your authorities to reserve contracts. Otherwise, this is not going to be very productive. I hope I have upset you. Happy to take questions either now or after Pedro has spoken. Thank you. Okay. Excellent.